You know what I found out? The reason they turned the devil's apple cart upside down everywhere they went and swept the known world, they swept it in less than a generation. Did you know that? Did you know they found out the, Christ, the early Christians covered? They went all the way to India, China. They went everywhere. They went everywhere. And they attacked the enemy and won over and over again. You say, well, I thought a bunch of them were killed. Well, that's all right. I mean, you're not planning to live forever, are you? Not in these old bodies. I hope not. If you're a manifest son of God, you may plan to, but you've got another thing coming. We're going to shuck these things one of these days and get a good one. Like Jesus. He's already bought it. <laughs> it's it bought and paid for. Mine's going to be so thin when I turn sideways, you won't be able to see me. <laughs> uh, but we've got a new one coming. There's no doubt about it. And God has something better for us even now, though. I'm convinced of this. I knew it in my spirit since I was a baby Christian. And I kept groping to find out where it was. Because teaching Bible and getting people saved and getting them into the Word and getting them to pray, getting them to memorize Scripture, getting them to witness and win other people to Christ, just wasn't getting the job done. Not like it needed to be. I still saw Christians being just steamrollered. And over and over again, the broken hearts and the smashed dreams and the shattered marriages and everything else on every hand. And the enemy was laughing up his sleeve at the best we could do. But the reason that first church swept across the world was because they were balanced. Did you ever hear that word? Balanced. Oh, you've gone to Worley's workshop, you're out of balance. And they hollered at me all the time, oh, I want to be sure and have a balanced ministry. I said, me too, me too. <laughs> because, see, they're out of balance. How can they be balanced when they have one-third of Jesus' ministry, evangelism, or two-thirds, evangelism and healing? That's two-thirds. They're two-thirds gospel. Nothing full gospel about them except talk. Talk's cheap, as you noticed. But full gospel, one third of Jesus' ministry was casting out devils. And until you do that, until you, and if you just talk about it and never do it, you're still on the losing end. And if you do inner healing, you might as well go into psychology. You'll do about as much good. Inner healing is not where it's at, people. Did you know you can have, they say, oh, but I had Jesus lead me back down through the pathways of time. Oh, I got so much help. I felt so great, so wonderful. The Spirit just warmed me. I imagine it did. Did you know you can do the same thing with the Virgin Mary, Buddha, or, Buddha, or Confucius, and it'll work the same way? Wonder why. I'll tell you one thing. If you attack in the name of Jesus Christ, the demons have a different way of responding. They don't quietly come out with a sigh. They scream, they fight. They just do what they did in the early days. They haven't changed. But if you sweeten up the message and water it down enough, you can get by without stirring them up. I've often thought it'd be sweet right in every Sunday morning service and a lot of churches preach a lot of Bible. You know, they really believe a lot of Bible. But they just don't believe all of it. I think it'd be nice for a couple of demons just to let out a war hoop right in the middle of the choir special. And another one right when the preacher got to his main point and see him shatter and go off his outline. You know, it's surprising. We don't get a whole lot of hate mail and that's really surprising because the books and tapes and videos are everywhere. And uh, when we get a hate letter, if you want to send us a hate letter, be sure and do that because we share it with everybody. <laughs> I mean, we pass it around and have a good laugh. Everybody has a good laugh. Because, you know, we don't get too many belly laughs like that. I mean, it's really funny. Because the, the criticism is always the same. And the demonic lies are always the same, even couched in the same words sometimes. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing. But we don't, get, we don't hear a whole lot of that. Uh, we used to, somebody, one preacher took after us on the radio one time years ago and was poo-pooing and making fun of us. 
And I said, I understand that Pastor Brown over in South Holland doesn't uh, believe Christians can have a demon. He's making fun of us on the radio the other day. I said, now, folks, I think we ought to pray for him. Bless his heart. He hadn't been over to see one alive, one manifest. Let's pray that one will manifest so he can know. And I want you to know, right on schedule, about a week later, they had the officers upset in their beautiful Christian Reformed congregation. They had a wild one, and they could not get it calmed down. And did you know something? They had to bring it over to our church to get it fixed. <laughs> And he had to get on the radio and apologize. <laughs> I didn't tell him to. It didn't make a difference to me, but I thought it was funny. And then we had, we had some people come to our church from, the, from a Baptist church. It's further out. Which way am I? Yeah, back out this way. In Indiana, a good old Baptist church. And see, all the Baptists are mad at us. They don't speak to us. The Baptists don't like us because we talk in tongues. And the Pentecostals are scared of us because we throw out demons. So that between the two, we're just a lonely little onion in a petunia patch around here. <laughs> well, we stay so busy, we don't have time to worry about it. But this Baptist, uh, two or three people came here for, uh, well, it was over in the other church at the time. They came and uh, they got some real deliverance and they got so excited and so thrilled because of the change in their lives. They went back and they were just bubbling over and they were able to do all these good things they'd been preached to about all these times. They never could do it. Couldn't read the Bible, couldn't pray. Now they can. And they were so excited and everything, they started sharing it. Well, that preacher, he got in the pulpit and he ripped up the planks. He raved and he ranted. He called to my name and said, anybody that would run over there to that wild church, and I don't know what all he said, but he, he couldn't believe Christian have a demon anyway. So, I, of course, I went back to my congregation and I said, now, Brother So-and-so over here, I understand he's having problems understanding Christian have a demon. I think it'd be nice, since he won't come to visit us and see him in person, then we could have one, that's the Father, to have one manifest right in the middle of his church. And Sunday morning would be a good time. They got a good crowd everybody could see and hear then. And so we prayed, and sure enough, about a week or two later, there was a man that they knew. He stood up right in the middle of the preacher's sermon and let out the war hoop and started cussing and screaming. And he run out through the corn patch like the shock. They were sitting there in a state of shock. You know, they didn't know what to do. What do you do when a demon manifests? Well, Worley's books make a lot more sense after that. Brother Hobart Freeman's gone to be with the Lord now, but he said a long time ago, he said an hour in a room with a demonized person manifesting will cause you to change your theology. <laughs> said, he said, you can call it demonized, you can call it having a demon, you can call it anything you want, but they're inside, and they're right, that's right. Well, I believe that God's church succeeded in the beginning because deliverance was where it belonged. It was that big old powerful engine out in front and it was chug-a-lugging and it was knocking everything off the tracks. And right behind it, just coming right along behind it, was evangelism. People started getting saved by the scads when they saw the power of God fall on the demons. And when the name of Jesus could flush the demons, then they knew it could flush their sins. Hmm? And then right behind that came miracles, signs, and wonders, and marvelous healings. It all works together. But the power is in deliverance. Now you let it soak in for a minute. The church has been evangelizing for centuries. The church has experienced periodic up, upheavals of mighty supernatural power in miracles and signs and wonders and real supernatural healings from, in the name of Jesus. Been a lot of phonies too, but there's been some real stuff too. But it has not stopped the evil one. It has not thrown him into absolute consternation. He's just had a slight check, if anything, and then gone right on about his business, destroying everything. But when deliverance comes, real deliverance, I'm not talking about the slap him on the wrist kind of, you get out, nasty thing, nasty thing, nasty, nasty, nasty. <laughs> I'm not talking about cream puffs at 20 paces. I'm talking about wrestling. My Bible tells me in Ephesians, Paul said, for we wrestle not 
with flesh and blood, but we do wrestle with principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, world rulers, kings and princes. There's the war. And we've been so busy fighting with flesh and blood, we hadn't got around to doing the real war. And the devil's run off with the show while we were doing that. Now, in front of most churches and Bible groups, they could adopt a motto for we wrestle not. <laughs> because they don't. They never engage the enemy. The best they do is shadow box. And say, oh, Lord, we command all the demons to leave. There they go. A lot of people batting butterflies and chasing blackbirds, but you tie into an old rhinoceros or a water buffalo and see what happens. That wasn't no butterfly that came at me and liked to rip my suit off of me. That was a full-size rhinoceros. That's what we call them. And there's some bigger ones than that. You'll hear about a great big one. Sunday morning it grew fangs and bit through a boot. You say, oh, I don't believe in that stuff. You will before you leave here. <laughs> We're going to keep your feet to the fire so you'll have something to go home with. We don't want you coming across the country and carrying away the same well rock of my baby in the treetop. Now we're going to sleep a little while now. You know, I believe it's over in 1 John. He says, the whole world lieth in the evil one. And if you go and look in the Greek, it's an amazing translation. That word lieth means to be cradled in the arms as a mother cradles a sleeping child, that she's got it to sleep and she's slipping it over to put it in the bed and she doesn't want to jostle it because it'll wake up. The whole world is rocked to sleep in the arms and it's time for the alarm bells to go off. It's time for the trumpets to sound. It's time for God's people to hear. That's what that song is about. Where is the trumpet to call the saints to battle? The trumpet is giving an uncertain sound, saying, come over here and build this city. God didn't say build cities. He said scatter. So when they tell me that God told them to build a city, I know they're lying. I mean, they may believe it, but what they're saying is not true. Check it out. God said scatter, people bunch. Jesus dispersed the crowd. He scattered them every time he turned around. And today, if it's big, it's great. The multitudes flow in. And the multitudes go out just as rotten as they were. And if they get healings, and if they have salvation ministered to them, they can't hold and they can't walk in it because the demons have got them. Demons talked to us a long time ago when we first got into this and they said, we don't fear the great ministries. I said, why is that? They're getting the word out. A lot of them are preaching the truth. Now I'd revise that and say, a few of them are preaching the truth. And he said, well, he said, I'll tell you early, they get a few people saved and that's disgusting. We don't like that, of course. But he said, we're still in control because they teach those people they get saved that they can't have a demon, a la Jimmy Swaggart. And they, they tell them they can't have a demon. Therefore, he said, you know and I know they can never have the solution for the problems they face because we're causing the trouble and they'll doctor for everything but us because they don't believe that we're there. He said, now you know, and that stupid bunch of idiots that follow you, you know what's wrong. But said, they won't listen to you talk. We tell them you're crazy, you're insane. You fell off the turnip truck when it went around the corner. <laughs> you got any sense? Who wants to listen to you? And he said, and the leaders, we've got them too. And he said, if they get too far off base, we'll just have our demons rise up inside them and twist them back where we want them. We control the whole thing. I thought about it and I thought, well, there's no use arguing with a demon when he's right. Amen? I mean, don't say demons always lie. They can tell the truth. They know the truth. 
And then he looked at me with such hatred and he said, but you blankety blank deliverance people. He said, we never know what you're going to do. He said, we always know what these others are going to do. We can even make it happen ourselves. But he said, we never know what you stupid idiots are going to do next. <laughs> that gave me great encouragement. You know what he was talking about? If you get into deliverance and spiritual warfare, you learn to hang loose with the Lord. And you learn to listen for him and listen for his word. And if he says, charge, you charge. Well, I've had more fun working with demons, you know. I'd be <laughs> dealing with a demon, you know, have one manifesting, you know. And I'd be dealing with this demon, and he'd be saying, no, no, I'm not coming out. And the Lord would say, Jezebel, standing back there and shouting, said, hey, Jezebel, you're in the status. Ah, how'd you know I was here? So I caught him off guard, and out he came. <laughs> That's fun, you know. Then I went back to harassing the other one. You can catch them off guard if you're sensitive to what the Holy Spirit's saying. Amen. And the deliverance army is a small but very powerful army. We're nothing in ourselves. It's our glorious leader that's everything. Don't ever get puffed up in yourself. You're just a handful of dirt. Big old demon told me that a long time ago. He said, Worley, it's not fair. It's not fair. I'm a mighty one. I'm a great one. I said, you don't look very great to me. He said, don't you talk to me that way. I said, well, you don't look very great. I'm not going to lie to you. Sitting there in the chair just. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he couldn't do anything, and I was glad. Because he had murder in his eyes. But I felt very confident, and he... And I put my face right over close to him and I said, why? He said, I'd like to smash your face. I said, why don't you do it? Now, I don't always do that. <laughs> but that time the Lord said, stick your face right up there and challenge you. And I did. And he said, you, no. Blankety blank you. And he cussed me and called me a lot of names my mother never did. And <laughs> he said, you know, Worley, that there's an angel between us. Well, I didn't, but I was glad to hear it. <laughs> and he said, it's just not fair. You're just dirt, handfuls of dirt, 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 dirt. I thought about it, and I said, yeah, you know, you're right. And I turned to the other workers, and I said, isn't that wonderful? Jesus would love and bless and save handfuls of dirt. And they all started praising the Lord. He said, oh, shut up. <laughs> Well, I mean, he did it. He, he reminded us of how wonderful it was that Jesus would love handfuls of dirt. And then he got mad about it because we started praising the Lord. <laughs> well, when I find out something that aggravates the demons, they're in trouble. Because I usually don't forget. I was talking to one someplace in a meeting, and uh, he, had, he had some information I wanted, and I was trying to trick him into telling me. I was just being very nonchalant. You, don't, you can't act very interested because then they'll, they'll clam up. They'll realize they're fixing to do something. But they're really dumb when you get them all puffed up. Work on their ego. They have ego problems. And I say, well, you probably don't know. Yes, I do. I said, well, I don't know. You're such a little one. They probably wouldn't tell you. <gasps> I'm not a little one. I'm a big one. Oh, you are? Well, you don't look very big to me. Well, I am. Well, I don't think you know. Yes, I do. I said, what's your name? Well, I'm not telling you. I said, well, you probably don't have one. I understand the little ones have numbers. <laughs> Ooh, they don't like that. <laughs> you say, where'd you get that? I made it up. <laughs> but it really aggravates the demons. They don't like that. They, they want you to be impressed with them. And sometimes I'll say, oh, you must be very powerful. Yes, I am. I said, are you very strong? Yes. You have a lot under your command? Yes. How many do you have? I'm not telling you nothing, Worley. I don't know what you're up to. <laughs> Who, me? And then I said, well, if you told me, I wouldn't be able to do anything with it. He said, oh, shut your mouth. I said, you wouldn't rest night nor day. I said, well, I'd probably forget all about it. 
He said, no, you wouldn't. You'd go right straight back to that motel and before you went to sleep, you'd write it all down and then you'd put it in those stupid books and said, don't you know that demons that tell you things and you put them in those dumb books and tell those idiot people across the country and said they get in trouble every time that thing's used. Said, Satan just beats our daylights out of them. Said, I'm going to tell you nothing. <laughs> but he did before I got through with him. There's more than one way to skin a cat or a demon. And you need to learn a few of them. I mean, you might as well have fun while you fight. I mean, a lot of people, they come in the deliverance meetings where I go, you know, they I've never been to one of these before. But I hear we're going to talk about demons. And they get so uptight, and then I get up and laugh, and I have a good time, and they think I'm sacrilegious or something. Well, I'd have a nervous breakdown if I got as uptight about demons as most people do. When you get used to them, you know, they're just like, they're just like tigers, you know. I mean, you don't walk up and stick your head in their mouth, but I mean, you know, you, you know they've got limits. And what you do, you find out how, where the chain, how long the chain is they're hooked on. And then you measure carefully, and you don't get closer, and you get right outside where they can reach you say, ah, ah. You, go, ah, ah. you say, ha ha, you missed me. But if you're smart, you learn where the chain is before you do that. There's a limit to what they, you see, they're moving inside God's will, contrary to what Mr. Copeland thinks. Everything in this universe, it's caged up inside our sovereign God's will. There's nothing going on, has happened, will happen, or ever will come to pass that'll take him by surprise. He hadn't been surprised yet, but I'll guarantee you one thing. Lucifer has been surprised over and over again, horribly surprised. When he, he, he messed up things in the garden, I mean, he got things in a ball over there. And he got Adam and Eve crossways and said, ha, ha, ha. And then he was horribly shocked because God came in with grace, something he'd never heard of. Grace, what's that? When you sin, you die. You're cut off from God. He knew the rules. He and his angels, when they sinned, they were cut off from God. He knew the rules. But God never bothered to tell him about grace because it didn't apply to angels. And God said, I didn't tell you about this part. This is grace. Not not fair. So that sinneth it shall die. And God said, someday I'll send the Savior. The devil said, no, you won't. And he set out, he got the boys set against one another. Remember? Cain and Abel. Cain wiped out Abel. The devil said, ha, 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 ha. Now let's see you send the Savior through a murderer, through one that had the do-it-yourself religion kit. First Christian scientist, did his own thing, worked his way. God said, toot, toot, move out of the way, here comes Seth. And the devil said, foiled again. He's done it to me again. Just as I got everything sewed up, he came through again. He had the whole world in wickedness under, under um, oh, what's his name? Star said Nimrod, but it wasn't Nimrod, somebody else. Anyway, Lamech, Lamech. Lamech, yeah. Had the whole world messed up. And God said, toot, toot, here comes Seth. He's going to be the one I'm going to work through. And over and over again, the seed was cut off and the devil made his plans. And every time he was horribly surprised, the biggest shock he ever got was at Calvary. And friend, he didn't climb down into hell because he's never been there, but he's going. <laughs> I'm going to stand there right by the great white throne. I'm going to watch him hit. I told several mean demons I've run across, give me a hard time, give the people a hard time. I said, brother, I said, listen here, I'm going to stand right by the great white throne and when you hit the fire, I'm going to shout hallelujah every time you spew. And I said, I hope God cooks you extra, extra crispy. <laughs> listen, those wicked beings have been around tormenting and destroying God's church, his people, and they've been messing up things for long enough. It's time somebody stood up and said, enough, no more, no further. 
No more cotton candy floss, fluff and feathers with no substance. It's time to take the kingdom. And we're not going to do it in our own strength. And when we do, those who are most involved will be least inclined to take any credit for it at all. Because those people will be those that he has purged and purged and repurged. And that's why you're going through all this hell on earth. God is scraping our surfaces. And just about time we think we, we're just about as clean and sparkling as we can be, God said there's some more to go. And you think, oh no. Another trip through the grinder? He said, oh yeah. There's still more. There's more to go. He's getting you ready for something that's worthwhile. Hang on, saint. Don't give up. God is shaping you to be a weapon in his hand. Let me see where it is. I've got it right here in the scriptures. Yes. 41. Look at 41, 14. Isaiah 41, 14. Oh, all of this whole chapter is so good. I know he's talking to Israel here, but we are his spiritual seed, are we not? And the promises there will transfer over into the spirit realm when we're battling the host of hell. Verse 13, I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. You think that was just for Israel? Back yonder? It was for them, but who else is it for? You have a claim on that? Will he hold your right hand? I believe he will. I'll hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Do you ever need help? Oh, boy. Well, you get a little further in deliverance. You'll need more help than that. And then, fear not, thou worm, Jacob. Ooh, what a dreadful thing to say. Worm? Did you ever see an old earthworm, an old fishing worm? They're all squiggly. They don't even have a backbone. Did you know something, though? He calls him a worm. He said, I'll help you, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Who's that? That's Jesus. He said, I'll help you, and I'll make them a new, sharp, threshing instrument having teeth. Now, this is a worm. An old, soft, squishy worm. If you was going to fight and make an, make an instrument to defeat the enemy, would you take a worm to do it? But you see, we don't work like God does. He's going to take a worm. He's going to make it a new, sharp, threshing instrument, having teeth. And thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small. Thou shalt make the hills as chaff. Going to beat them to powder, dear friend. And that is the worms. You talk about Jesus getting glory, that's when it's coming. He's going to pick up insignificant, unknown, unrecognized people who have learned the secret of surrender to him and believe in his word and have fallen madly in love with Jesus and want to be used of him more than anything else they want. And, they, and when this happens, he's going to take those little weak, wobbly, squishy things that don't have any backbone, don't have any sense, not smart, not pretty, nothing about them, and he's going to make a new threshing instrument, and he's going to powder the mountains with them. And the world's going to stand by, I could understand it if they used dynamite, but that little worm, that little woman, that little fella, why, well, he's nothing. And they'll have to stand back in awe and say it had to be God. It had to be the Lord Jesus Christ. It had to be that what they were talking about, the name of Jesus, has to be the power. They could have never done it. There is no way they could have ever done what they've done. People, that's coming. He said, thou shalt fan them. The wind will carry them away. The whirlwind will scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord and glory in the whole world. He said, he's not only going to have you power to the mountain, he's going to blow them away. And off they go. And said, so then you will rejoice and have a, have a big rejoicing session. I like that a lot better than 
I'm trying to hold out faithful to the end. Pray for me, brethren. I've been saved and sanctified for 20 years, and I want you to pray that I'll make it out faithful to the end. I used to hear those testimonies. I'd go to meetings, you know. And I'd look at that man or woman doing that, and I thought, Lord, I, if it makes you feel like that, I don't believe I want to be one. I mean, they looked like they were in absolute agony. I mean, to, to be making it faithful to the end, if it hurt that bad, it didn't look like it was much fun on the way. Don't worry about making it faithful to the end. Just surrender yourself and throw yourself and spend yourself in the battle for Jesus. We used to sing a song when I was growing up, Give of Your Best to the Master. And one of, the, one of the verses in there said, throw your soul's fresh glowing ardor into the battle for truth. There's nothing better for young people than to lock horns with the enemy and to fight him and learn how to fight him early. This generation is coming into understanding and knowledge of the truth of the word of God that no generation since the first generation has had. I got to thinking about this. You know, I've been, I've been a revival bug for years. When I was a student in college, I used to read all the... Uh, Bible. Matter of fact, when I had an English theme to write, I'd get permission to write it on the Great Awakening. And boy, then I'd just plow through. I had such a good time. I had a hard time sifting it all down. I had such a good time researching about what God did back in those... I was in a Christian college. I could do that. And, um, but I researched all these revivals. And it made me hungry to see God do it again. And yet, as we moved into deliverance and, we, and God began to open up the fragmented soul, sins of the fathers, and binding and loosing and things of this sort, I, I got to thinking, gee, you know, these people that had these tremendous sweeps of God in the past, they didn't even know about these things. And I said, Lord, what are we doing? He said, well, son, he said, if without these powerful weapons that I'm opening up to the, in the end times for your pe my people. If without those, they could sweep and shake nations, the men and women who followed me. What do you think it's going to be like when armed with this truth that had been lost down through the centuries to the church in large measure? What do you think it's going to be like when my people armed with these weapons plow into the enemy in the end time. He said, it's all in my purpose. It's all in my plan. The devil has run riot on the earth. It's time for him to be challenged. Only the power of Jesus is going to do it. And it's not going to come through a bunch of pompous, strutting preachers. It's not going to come through a bunch of arrogant, holy people. It's not going to come through a bunch of people who are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. It's going to come through people who have dedicated themselves and fallen in love with Jesus and have committed themselves to the death to get God's people free because that's his call. You know what his call is today? Set my people free. You say, oh, I thought it was a win the lost. We've got the lost by the literal thousands everywhere have been saved. But they're bound. They're in the churches. If you get them free, they'll win people by the hundreds of thousands. They cannot do the job. They're hindered and hampered. And the best they do, and some of them are doing real well, but how much better will they do when they're set free? And because not everybody will listen to the message of deliverance, those of us who've heard the call of God must get ourselves set and study and pray and set every person free that we can find. Don't waste your time arguing and trying to get theology on your side. I've heard theologians speak and they dazzled me with their brilliance and their, their play on the languages and oh, they just spoke so wonderfully. But I never had one warm my heart. But I've heard some preachers who had fallen madly in love with Jesus, couldn't say an English sentence correctly, but they were on fire and they were in love with Jesus. And my heart caught fire and I want to go out and tear the world apart for Jesus. And I'm not talking about this old false fire stuff, that the main reason they're steaming you up is to separate you from your pocketbook. 
watch out for the greedy lucre. Thing. One of the things God points out, and I don't know why God's people can't see it, the one who serves God must not be greedy, a filthy lucre. If he is, he is disqualified. Now, next time you listen on TV or radio or in your churches, listen for the cash register. And if it's going ding, 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 you go ding, dong, ding, dong, and go the other way. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. If God's people, the gullible gooses, would stop supporting these people, they'd die. They'd die of attrition. Because many of these birds are in it for the money, friend. Don't tell me. They've learned a little circle. They know how to work the gimmicks. Don't let them work you. And if you'll get into deliverance, discernment will burst forth in you and the gifts of the Spirit will begin to move and you'll go into meetings and you'll think, what's the matter with me? I'm getting awfully critical. I used to come to these meetings and enjoy it. And now everywhere I look, I see religious spirits. There's nothing wrong with you. You just, you just now you're beginning to see things like God saw it. That's all. And God is showing you so you can get out of that. Come out of Babylon. We're coming out of Babylon. We're coming out of Babylon with a song in our heart and our voices filled with praise. We'll take our harps down from the willow tree for the Lord our God has set us free with a shout, praise God. When my big foot came back, it, it disconnected. <laughs> I thought I was losing the, uh, losing the anointing. I just lost my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you shout it, you're under the anointing, don't you? <laughs> For God, so love the world. <laughs> See, I can do that too. <laughs> Now that's, don't think that volume is power. Matter of fact, I think that Jesus lowered his voice sometimes. And that got everybody quiet. See how quiet it's gotten? See everybody say, hmm, huh? hmm. And I know it worries the daylights out of the demons when you don't yell at them. I, know, I always know when certain people have gone through a place teaching deliverance, because you can't hear your ears. The worker, you can't tell which one's manifesting, the demon or the, the person who's got a demon or the worker, because they're all yelling at top, top lung. Our workers are all trained, keep your voice down. What are you shouting about? You don't have to yell at that demon. Oh, it's a 30! <laughs> no, it just means you're overexcited because probably you're not sure of yourself. How much better to smile and say, are you having trouble, demon? I've had them say, yes! I said, well, let me help you. I'll arrange a coming out party for you. I've had them look at me with hatred and say, you never helped one of us in your life. I said, have we met before? No, but I've heard about you. <laughs> I went to Indonesia, they'd already heard about me. Went to Australia, they'd heard about me there. It's nice to be known. You know, you don't feel as lonesome when, when persons there know you. A lot of the people didn't know me, but there were persons there that knew me very well. And they came reluctantly to meet me. And they were so tired, they'd been working so hard, we put them on vacation in the dry places. Listen, there's something worth fighting for out there. The order of the day is put deliverance where it belongs, at the forefront of the train, it'll pull the whole thing. It's got enough power and to pull. And you're not, gonna, you're not gonna fail to win people. People get saved around here all the time, except they just don't come streaming down the aisles and we write them on the book. Our people win them out here, there, and yonder. And sometimes they get saved back in the pew. 
course, that's kind of hard on the preacher because he doesn't get to stand up and say, I just led three more to the Lord. Am I not wonderful? It's kind of awful when your people get to where they minister and they can do it. Have people walk up to you and say, Pastor, you've probably seen this verse, but when we were dealing with such and such, well, this verse really worked. I feel like telling them, shut up. I would have thought of that. I'm the pastor. What are they doing digging all this out? Would you believe in places where I've gone, I've actually had pastors that got angry with me because I threw the gates open wide and encouraged their people to minister? They didn't want the people to minister. They, they were afraid that somehow the people wouldn't love them, wouldn't appreciate them. I don't have any problem with that. My people love me, appreciate me, fuss at me, jump on me, usually when they're manifesting. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't understand. The object of ministry is to enlist the body. We need the whole body in a war effort. We don't need three or four high-powered, supercharged people. We need the entire body to be enlisted. Get some of these pew warmers to be into the battle and learn how to wrestle with principalities, power strong. Learn how to do it in the daytime, out where they're working. While you're washing dishes, get your warfare prayers and, and sock it to them while you're washing those old dishes. First thing you know how the dishes done, you won't even remember it. Oh, I hate washing dishes, don't you? While you're doing something else, while your hands are busy, your warfare prayers take you right into warfare with the enemy. Use those warfare prayers. They're models. Adapt them to your own use. But they're useful because they attack the enemy. The demons have said that we must stop teaching binding loosing and stop sending out those blankety blank warfare prayers. We just had 10,000 warfare prayers printed. We plan to keep on going and shooting them out everywhere to get God's people moving in the attack. We've got to move off of the defensive. Come out of those trenches, fix bayonets, get your grenades ready. I don't care if there are tanks out there. We've got some grenades that blow the tracks off those things. And then we can take a can opener and open that thing up and see what's in there. The order of the day is still attack, attack, attack. Don't let the enemy rest. Keep after him. You say, but he's after me. Well, then hit him back. He's not going to back off just because you say, well, I'll leave you alone if you leave me alone. That's like making an agreement with Soviet Russia. <laughs> They're not going to keep any agreement. You just might as well, and, and you're a marked person already. You came to this workshop. You say, wait a minute, I just came to look it over. Well, it's too late. <laughs> Your attendance has been noted in the spirit realm, and you've got several things assigned to you you didn't have when you came. You said, you didn't tell me. Well, it's too late now. <laughs> you better load up with all the ammunition you can get and get all the tapes and books and stuff and borrow everything you can get and bear down because you're going to, you, you, you think you had it rough before, but they're going to come after you. They say, we'll put you out of bed. We'll teach you to go to that stupid workshop. But we'll give you some weapons that you can defeat the enemy with. But you have to use them. It's like soap, you know. You can have bar soap in every room and stink. <laughs> and a lot of people, you know, they have a book in every room, but they haven't read them and they haven't put them into practice, so they still are not able to cope with the enemy. You've got to, you've got to dig in and you've got to do something about it. And you've got to start using it. And the, the good thing about it, it's simple, it's easy. There's nothing difficult about it. You can be effective against the enemy. Don't you let the enemy tell you that you can't. He's a liar. We've seen hundreds of people rise up all across this country. God said there would be an avalanche of deliverance come across this land if we'd be faithful to give the message. That's why we've hung in here and we've seen people come and go by the dozens and we're still here, and we haven't altered our course. We're still plowing straight into the storm. And we plan to give the devil a lot more trouble. He tried to wipe me out a couple of years ago, and I've got a burst of energy and strength coming, and I'm busy writing again, 
And for a while, I didn't feel like reading, writing, or doing anything. I was just more dead than alive. But a lot of you people prayed. And I'm back. And I plan to be as dangerous to the enemy and more so as I've ever been. Because I'm pretty mad at him about messing, messing around with me. He was messing with me. And I'm going to mess with his business now. People, let's get our armor on tight. Let's get our weapons in place. Let's plow into him. And every time he hits us, hit him back. The demons are cowards. Once you use your weapons on them, once you get a good solid lick at them, they, they get to where they don't like to attack you. Demons have told me we don't even, a demon has to have a special order to attack those stupid people in your church. I said, why? He said, because nobody wants to go there. It's a dreadful place. And he said, and those people are awful. I said, they are not. They're, they're wonderful people. He said, no, they're not. He said, they fight back and they fight dirty. <laughs> now you have to understand demon lingo. That means that the believers win instead of the demons. That's dirty fighting to them. Now, you want to learn how to fight dirty? You might as well because they're going to cream you anyway. So you might as well give them what for. And we had also, we've had witnesses too. Today, somebody was telling us that they had tangled with the Satanists and the witches before. They beat them up. And this last time, the demons were not able to handle them. The last time they were here at the workshop, they joined this church. And the demon said, I don't know why it is, but we can't get to you. See, the prayer cover of this church comes over our long distance members. You become part of this body. Now, I have to warn you about this. You'll also get all the jostling we get. I had people call me from Arizona one time and he said, when are your folks having a siege of all kinds of this and that and the other hitting them, the kids and everything? I said, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Well, we're long distance members, so we're getting the same treatment. Just wanted to know that the, the enemy's not partial. He dishes it out to everybody that's on that list. If you join with us, you'll have to be, you'll, all, you'll get the blessings, but you'll also get the shakings when he tries to shake you off the tree. But that's all right. We'll survive. It will make you drop to might near nothing. You'll shrivel up, just be so tiny and a little teeny. Like me, you'll just be so withered away till you look unhealthy. That's the only, the only problem you have with this. Listen, wouldn't you rather do something worthwhile than burn up daylight for nothing? Learn how to attack the enemy. Hit him where it hurts. We've got the weapons of our warfare. We're just learning to fight. And I'd like to see the church come forth and beat the daylights out of the devil, wouldn't you? Gideon didn't have a big army. Jehoshaphat was outnumbered. And the enemy was slaughtered before him. And I tell you, Elijah's my hero. Woo, he was one man standing up against the whole host. And he won. Because he was depending on the Lord of hosts. Who are you depending on? You know, you're not going to live forever. What are you saving yourself for? What are you giving yourself for? Ask the Lord to help you to find your place. And don't get all carried away with wild fancies. Oh, I got to sell my house, sell my car, go to Bible school and learn. Go out and win the world. Stay right where you are. God will put you to work where you are. And if you need to be thrust out, he'll open the door and put you out. We've got too many of these people running around. Oh, God told me. God told me. They have an attack of the lead disease every time you turn around. I felt lead. I felt lead. It's a serious disease. It attacks without warning. <laughs> I felt led to go. I felt led to come. I had led to this. Led, led, led. I got to you. Don't get the lead disease. Just get your hand in the hand of the Lord and let him actually direct you and learn to be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, somebody walked up and told me, said, I got a word for you, sister. Oh, yes, I see it. The world's waiting for your ministry. Go sell your house, sell your car, give half of it to me, and then go forth into the wind. 
Oh, yeah. I can see you've been around it too. Mm -hmm. That's called religious racketeering, friend. God hasn't got anything to do with that kind of stuff. And when God tells you something, or somebody tells you God told them, just say, well, when he tells me, I'll let you know. I had a person walk up to me one time and said, God told me he was going to give me $50. I said, he did. <laughs> they said, yes. I said, well, when he tells me, I'll do it. You mean you're not going to do it? I said, no. You don't need other people to tell you what God said. God wants to train you. Anything that comes to you like that is going to be by way of confirmation. And it'll be sparingly used. God does not wholesale. A lot of people, you know, they get hung on this. You got a word for me, brother? You got a word for me? And I lift up the whole Bible and say, yeah, here it is. I go and mean some people say, I had this dream. Oh, I want you to tell me what it means, Pastor. And I say, well, and they, they, they dump it on me. You know. Most of the time when I get through, I say, well, it sounds to me like you ate something that didn't agree with you. <laughs> of course, that's not the answer they're looking for. Quit going off on these religious hobby rides. Get, get into the Word. Get on your knees and learn to fellowship with the Lord. And Get in fellowship. There's some believers somewhere you can fellowship with. God's got somebody. Elijah thought he was all alone too, but God had some others. So you're not as alone as you think. And after all, once in a while, you can touch base with us. We're still here. The devil's tried to wipe us out, but we're still going on. And we'll go on as long as God gives us breath and strength to go. Praise God. The order of the day is attack, attack, attack. Don't let the enemy hornswoggle you. Don't let him convince you that you don't have a ministry. You do. But don't go out and try to win the world single-handedly. Do what God gives you to do. You don't even have to run out and look up the prospects. You just get alone with the Lord and get yourself ready. Start reading the deliverance books. Check them with the scriptures. Cross-check and read and pray and say, Lord, I'm your vessel. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Start doing your warfare prayers. The next thing you know, people are going to be knocking on your door. It's happened over and over again. People have gone from these workshops. When they got home, the phone started ringing. People called me. One lady told me, she said, I couldn't believe it. I heard them talk about it at the workshop. But she said, my phone rang. This lady started to tell me, and I knew what it was. I said, yes, I know what your problem is. Can I help you? Yes, I know what to do. Come on over, and we'll get at it. And she did. She knew what to do. She knew it was deliverance the woman needed. God will send them to you. You don't have to round them up. You don't have to run them down. Praise God. 